I was roughly 19 years old when this story occurred. I'm a tall male around 6 foot 1 and I was living with my parents at the time. For reference, I live in a fairly condensed region of my country and luckily for me, I live on the more lavish side of town in a rather large house. However, due to where I am, burglaries and home invasions are not a rare occasion and I knew at some point it would happen to me but that didn't make it any less petrifying. My parents wanted to have a romantic week in a way as their jobs have kept them very busy and they felt very much stressed. I gladly obliged as I wished to have the house to myself so I could play games until my eyes went square. They gave me about 50 euros for food and essentials and quickly sped off to the awaiting taxi. The rest of the afternoon went fairly quickly and a couple of hours passed and I'm on my PC with a couple of my mates. I looked over at my bedside table and my dated alarm clock read 1am. I slowly rubbed my eyes and I decided I was too tired to continue playing my games. I told my mates that I was heading off and pressed the power button listening out for the final sound of the whirring fan to die out. I headed downstairs to get a glass of water, but then as I was grabbing the glass I heard a slow, inconsistent tapping over at my window. This obviously confused me as it was so sudden, but the area I live in is known for foxes to try and get in to get food, so I checked the door, it was locked, and headed upstairs. The tapping eventually stopped and I sighed a long sigh of relief as the sound was beginning to aggravate me. I was lying in my bed trying to get to sleep but roughly half an hour later I was awoken to the same scratching sounds. But this time it was at my window. Now I've read enough horror stories and creepypastas to know looking out my curtain was a horrendously horrible idea. However, this was bugging me so I crept over to my curtain and slowly pulled it back, dreading what was on the other side. My stomach lifted, as I was greeted with nothing, but at the same time I closed them, I heard the shatter of glass in the kitchen. I was terrified. I heard the sound of thick, heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. I snapped out of my frozen state and quickly closed and locked my door just as whatever was in my house got to the landing. I rummaged through my drawer for something to defend myself with. I unearthed an old Swiss army knife that my dad gave me when I joined the scouts years ago. All this time this person is kicking at my door. I picked up the knife and jumped in my closet. Not too long after I hear the sound of my door finally giving up and letting this person in. I look through the gap. I saw a rugged man standing in my room, virtually foaming at the mouth with a rage that I had never seen before. His eyes were bloodshot, a deep crimson, and he was throwing my things, searching for me. I knew I had to act. I finalized on the idea that if this psycho came to my closet, I was going to stab him. He came over to my closet, and I knew the inevitable was going to happen. He pulled open my closet door, and I was greeted with this man who had menace in his eyes. I took no chances and plunged my blade into his chest penetrating through his bone, letting out a blood-curdling scream before collapsing to the floor. I ran so fast out of my house, I got carpet burn along the bottom of my feet. I rushed to my neighbors as quickly as I could and explained to them the situation, and they called the cops. I stood outside my house as they dragged the ragged man out. Needless to say, I stayed at my neighbor's house, as all this insanity was sorted out. In the summer of 2016, my best friend at the time, Rhonda, introduced me to this girl, Jerry, who was 18. I was 15. I've got to admit that I was pretty desperate back then because within a week of knowing her, I said yes when she asked me out. Jerry was pretty and everyone has flaws, of course, but she had something off about her. The way she talked was in an odd, egotistical way. She admitted to many of the substances that she had taken in her life, that her dad was in jail for pretty much being a stalker, and that sometimes her ex would plead on a weekly basis to get back with her. As I said, I must have been desperate. We dated for most of the summer, and honestly, those three months weren't too horrible. 
We would go to each other's houses and hang out and then go on adventures that she felt more comfortable enough to drive to and from, considering I didn't have a car at the time. Suddenly one day Jerry said, I don't want to be with you anymore. With no explanation. Admittedly, I was a bit heartbroken, but she was eager to stay friends. After the breakup, there was a week of conversations between us that I believe were intentionally made to hurt me. She would still call me Babe and other cute names that would feel like a dagger to the heart. One night, I told her to stop doing this because it only made the heartbreak worse. She acted like it was such a horrid thing to ask of her. We argued about it for hours, it felt like, and it ended with me explaining that I do care for her, but I've realized that I wouldn't want to get back with her after all of this. She seemed to switch demeanors and said she understood and wanted to go to sleep. I couldn't sleep that night for whatever reason, but around 3 in the morning I get notifications of Jerry posting all over her social media about wanting to end her life. There were pictures of her self-harming and others of lots of pill bottles, which both looked taken in her home. I texted her frantically asking her to stop and get help or I would call an ambulance. I was shaking so bad while she messaged me back slowly after each text. She tried to explain that I would be fine and she's just doing her thing. As I went to call an ambulance anyway, I realized all the time she purposefully didn't tell me her address, she only drove me there. I had no idea where Jerry lived. She consoled me that she ended up not taking anything and would go to sleep. Knowing that she wouldn't change her mind any further, I gave in to it but didn't go to sleep. Two hours later, Jerry sent a Snapchat of her by a stomach pump machine in the hospital, making some regular face in that stupid dog filter. She told me she was admitted into the psych department in the local hospital and would have to stay for a week. The last thing I told her then was that I hoped she gets the help she needed, and I honestly meant it. A week later, she texted me and Rhonda trying to make time for us to hang out. I already didn't want to be with her, and Rhonda assured me she didn't either. Out of curiosity, I asked why she didn't want to. Rhonda explained to me that this girl was cheating on me with many people during our relationship and had a past of doing some serious illicit substances with her father before he was incarcerated. She knew well about it all and even showed me screenshots of Jerry talking to other people in beyond flirtatious ways that she had sent Rhonda, saying things like, He's cute, isn't he? Planning to never talk to either of them again, I texted back Jerry and told her to never talk to me again and attach the screenshots. She tried to explain herself, but I just blocked her. Later that night, as I was at home, probably watching some movie, my phone blows up with calls and texts from unknown numbers, cursing at me and asking me what I was doing. The one threatened me constantly, telling me if I don't give her the stuff back, I will regret it and never see the light. I was confused as the only thing I got out of the relationship was a birthday gift. Even if I blocked the numbers, there would be more rushing to call me names and harass me. I unblocked Jerry's number and tried to tell her that if she doesn't stop all of this, I'll call the cops. She cut me off almost immediately and asked me to come outside my door. I rushed to see that no one was in my driveway. I ignored her and continued, but she cut me off again. Come outside with a birthday present I bought you or I swear you don't want to know what I'll do to you, and hung up. I looked in every window until I saw her black Jeep Patriot parked by the road in sight across from my house. I picked up a stupid box of essential oils I got from her earlier in the relationship, along with my mace, and stood by the door. Since it was visible from the road, I just waited there. There was no way I was going to walk it to her. I saw her start her car and pull into my driveway. Shaking from my life and with mace ready to be sprayed, I walked to the car and handed the box through her window. Jerry was laughing along with a couple of her friends that I've never met, who all had that look that addicts do. While they looked at me like I was some food platter, she pulled out of my driveway fast, almost running my feet over. I didn't hear anything from her, only things about her. Rhonda had also dropped her and told me that Jerry would sit in front of her work for hours, just staring at her through the windows. 
However, sometime in the next fall, Jerry tried messaging me on Facebook, attempting to make things mutual. I blocked her without any replies. Then, one night in the next summer, I was scrolling on Instagram until I found this post from a spam account that talked about cheating on their boyfriend in a very casual tone. I looked through their posts, trying to understand why they would do such a thing, or even better, who they were. I had a belief that I was following this account for a long time, maybe two years even. Their captions consisted of emotional poems and regular spam things, like complaining about everything. It wasn't until around the tenth post I realized how familiar this sounded. There were poems about days I had spent with Jerry and things we had said to each other. But there were poems about hurting me, literally ripping my heart out because I didn't deserve it. I was horrified, asking what I could have done for her to feel that way. I didn't call the cops only because my parents don't feel comfortable doing that sort of thing, but I felt in danger. I confronted Jerry through private messages telling her to delete everything and leave me alone. And she took it as a joke, explaining how I have no hold over her now that we're apart. My friends and I reported the account until it was taken down. To this day, those poems keep me up some nights, describing the specific ways and all the different things that she was going to do to me, even where and how, like it was planned to do so. I told my mom about it finally a year ago when a package was sent to me in the mail from her, essential oils worth around $100 with a note saying, I hope you still want these like I still want you. My mom took it lightly, explaining that they're only words and she won't do anything. I just know that every time I spot a black Jeep Patriot, my heart skips a beat. November 17th, 2017 was my girlfriend's 18th birthday. Now I was 20, but we had been off and on for around 4 years never actually being official. Yeah, strange it may seem. While I had known her my entire childhood and helped her through an abusive relationship, she had shut me out of her life from the span of August 2015 to January 2016, despite all my efforts to stay and listen and help her. I had later come to find out it wasn't her, but rather her boyfriend at the time, whom I will refer to as John. My family is very wealthy and we live in a very nice gated community which... Only those with proper permission and security badge can get into. My girlfriend will be referred to as Jessica to keep her and myself safe as this is still an ongoing problem. November 17, 2017, Jessica and I went to a movie at a movie theater which my parents had owned for over three years, and we had never had any problems aside from a robbery attempt in 2015, which was unsuccessful, and thankfully no one was injured in the process. Well, after that, my parents had upgraded the security system with good quality cameras and locks on all doors. When I went to the movies, we would usually wait until after hours and go have the theater to ourselves. Everyone had left both customers and employees at this time as it was nearly 2 a.m. The security system had been set and there were motion sensors in all the halls to detect movement, but the theaters didn't have this as it wasn't exactly necessary given you can't get anyone into the building without using the hall. I don't remember any cars or anything, looking out of the ordinary as we pulled in and walked into the theater. We go to the front door, disarm the security system, not leaving any doors unlocked, and me and Jessica proceeded upstairs to power on the projector and start our movie. Turning it on in the big theater for better picture quality and sound, we made our way downstairs and grabbed some popcorn and candy eh, that I had the employees leave in the back room knowing we were going to a movie. Jessica said she heard something, and I just chalked it up to being her typical paranoid self. When I opened the door for her, I got a very uneasy feeling, but going against my better judgment, we proceeded to walk into the theater and watch our movie. At some point, Jessica said she had to use the bathroom and walked out down the hall. Five minutes go by and I hear Jessica running into the theater, which I assumed as because she was extremely excited for this movie and didn't want to miss it. She then said, sorry, I just got a really bad feeling walking down the hall by myself. 
This didn't seem strange to me as being alone in this big building when no one is there and it is pretty dark is sketchy at best. Dismissing her comment once again as her being paranoid, we finished our movies sometime after. I went, set the security system, waited for it to activate and proceeded to my car. I was quite spoiled and being a total car enthusiast, I had bought a brand new Corvette just weeks before this. Seeing something strange about the stance of the car, I had noticed it was slopped toward the ground in the front driver's side. I had rushed outside to see what had happened. Obviously it was a flat tire, but I had drove less than 50 miles on these brand new tires. Making it to the car, I had seen a very prominent slash mark near the rim. I was furious. No one messes with my car. I was ready to punch someone in the nose. Jessica started to try and calm me down. Through the surprisingly well-lit parking lot, I was able to make out a silhouette. It didn't take much for me to start walking over to him as the amount of adrenaline I had running through my veins right now, I'd be able to KO Dwayne Johnson. As I was walking over, I realized it looked a lot like John. I see a flash of light that I instantly recognize as a metal reflection. Jessica behind me saying, oh my god, he has a knife, didn't worry me in the slightest. Humbly, I like to think I could hold my own as I played running back and linebacker all throughout high school. Being able to bench 240 with a very stocky build, I started walking over to him. I heard him talking to Jessica, saying things such as, come home with me baby, I missed you, and other nonsense. This instantly made me even more angry than previously. He starts walking over to me, thinking he's tough. I didn't think for a second he was going to use this knife, which I was terribly wrong. He slashed my left arm, which was the breaking point. I was dead set on ending this kid right there. With two hits, he was on the ground with a crooked nose and a broken jaw. I continued to hit him three more times while he was on the ground, smashing his head into the ground so hard I couldn't believe he still had a skull. By this time, Jessica had called the cops minutes before and managed to pull me off him. The cops got there and called the paramedics. They took the knife and put it in an evidence bag, taking him back to the hospital and paramedics patching up my arm before I went in to eventually get 32 stitches and had to get surgery because of the nerve damage I had suffered from his knife. The cops took Jessica's and my statement, took pictures of my car and everything else that had happened. Pulling the camera footage showed just how in the wrong he was, as well as him slashing my tire in my arm. He ended up getting put in a mental institution for five years, which I have since been informed has been increased to 20 years for constant threats about my girlfriend and I while talking to a counselor. After he had been checked into the hospital and put under police surveillance, other officers got a warrant to search his apartment. In his apartment, they found photos and videos of stuff he did to my girlfriend while they were dating. He would give her sleeping pills and roofies and take advantage of her. At the time, she was only 16 and didn't even know about it. She still isn't aware of everything he did because I informed the detectives and talked through it with her parents to give her time to recover before telling her what happened. John, I swear to God if I ever see you again, no matter how changed you are, you won't be taking another breath. So I was diagnosed with Crohn's beginning of 2013. During my first major flare-up, I lost my grandma on my mom's side and my papa on my dad's side. Though losing both was heartbreaking, I had a stronger connection with my grandma because she was the only grandmother I had gotten to know growing up. Both of them had always had a way of making people around them feel at ease. My grandma made you feel at home and loved, then my papa was someone you know would go to the ends of the earth for you. They always had a scent that lingered around them. Grandma always smelled of Chanel, and papa, cigarettes and motor oil. Now after their deaths, I continued receiving treatment for Crohn's and for the most part had it under control till about 2017, when another flare-up landed me in the hospital. I was in so much pain that no pain medication would work. I was brought into the ICU for pain treatment while waiting for surgery. Turns out that my bowel was so inflamed that it had swollen shut a whole three-foot section. 
If I had waited any longer than I did, it's likely that I would have died. I was brought into surgery, a complete ball of nerves, but just before they placed the mask for the anesthesia on me, I caught the scent of Chanel. It took all my fears away and honestly left me so relieved that I could feel tears coming. I had asked the nurse standing above me who was wearing the perfume. I wanted them to know how much that meant to me to have that thought of my grandmother. She looked down at me sort of confused and told me that they weren't allowed to wear perfume when they knew they were on call for surgery. Then the anesthesia kicked in and I was out like a light. The surgical team probably thought I had gone a bit loopy from it and the painkillers and they went on with the surgery. The next thing I remember was laying down on my back. The room I was in was warm and the light was more of a golden hue than electric lighting like a room filled with sunlight. I could feel my body wanting to rise from the table, but I felt multiple pairs of hands holding me down, the two strongest at my shoulders, and I just knew that it had to be my grandma and papa. I have had ideas who the others were, but I won't get into them right now. I could feel one of my grandma's hands stroke my hair softly. All I knew for certain was that they didn't want me to go somewhere, that they were fighting to keep me on that table. All of a sudden I could feel my body become heavy, sink back into the table and things going black again. I woke up again a couple of days later in a hospital bed to the noise of my mom and dad having a fit toward my doctor and surgeon, my now husband holding my hand praying over it. Side note, my husband isn't religious, that's how scared he was. To have a former US Marine that scared really shocked me later on. This is where I find out that Something had gone wrong during surgery. From what I gathered, I had a bad bleed that almost lost me too. Before I could process any of it, I spoke out in what must have been a rasp because it freaked everyone out in the room. I looked toward my mom, told her that she needed to stop. She was making a mountain out of a molehill. She turned white. No one has said that since her mother passed away. Quickly though, she and my dad hurried over to me and I spent the rest of the week in the hospital, in and out of it because of the painkillers. But that isn't the end. I was taken to my parents' home for rest. The entire time I would catch glimpses of my grandma and papa throughout the house, and I wasn't the only one to sense them. My dog would stare at them from time to time. I felt like I was safe and healing well till one day about a week after I released. Now I never liked the smell of cigarettes that clung to my papa, and sometimes when I was younger it made me sick. I started to get really sick, throwing up nothing but fluid and was in horrible pain worse than before the surgery. I was so uncomfortable that I couldn't get comfortable and in so much pain I kept telling my mom that I wanted to be put out of my misery. The entire time I could smell my papa's cigarettes. This continued late into the night when my husband finally rushed me back into the hospital. Turns out my pain was due to a large blood clot in my portal valve. This feeds blood to the intestines and liver. I was only 23. This type of thing doesn't happen to women my age, or at least I thought. Turns out I do have a blood clotting condition. With my surgery and disease, it put me at higher risk. I have decided that my papa was trying to send me a message. I was brought back into the ICU for monitoring. I had a few more scares during my second stay had three IVs pop veins, woke up one morning to a puddle of blood and IV fluid. Then because I had grown weak and still wasn't eating, I had to have a sort of IV tube inserted into my arm to pump in nutrients. And last but not least, a strange reaction when I was having an episode of pain from the clot. Apparently I had forgotten where I was, why I was there, and who I was. The whole experience has left more than my physical scars. I now deal with depression and anxiety despite moving on with my life. The few good things I was able to take away from it all was the idea that my grandma and papa were there with me when I needed them. But sometimes I wonder if what happened in limbo was real or something my dying brain made up. What do you think? This happened about a year ago, but nonetheless I am still freaked out by it on the daily. I work in a pretty known store in the local mall. 
I've been working at the store for going on about six years now. We sell a lot of random items. The store is known for having wacky things in it. Things for commercials, infomercials to Facebook, Instagram ads, and more. While working here, I've seen my fair share of mall rats, druggies, creeps, and just all-around weirdos. The mall is in a pretty terrible side of town anyways, so I'm used to it. I've had my number asked for a handful of times, and some things that have made me call security, but I never really think too much about it and carry on with my days. On this particular day, I had a few regular customers and a few new ones just wanting to check out the store. A man and his daughter walk in, the dad being actually really good looking and his daughter is awfully cute. I proceed to help them with some questions about toys and even start talking to the daughter, asking what toys are favorite, making conversation. He ends up buying our toys that were buy two get one free, but you have to be part of our program to get the deal, which means we input your name, phone number, and email. This will all come together later, however. They leave and I proceed with the day. A few days later, I'm back to work with the regular 2-9 to nine shift. I don't work full time, so when I have days off, they're usually in a row. My manager leaves at 5.30 every day and I'm on my own from there. Just the simplest tasks like answering the phone calls, ringing customers in, you know, retail. About halfway into my shift, I get a call on the store phone. At this point, I'm the only one working, so I answer with the usual useless spiel. It was a man asking about one of our most popular sellers, a pain therapy system. Nothing out of the ordinary, as I usually get calls about this item. I continue telling him how it works and the cost of it. As I'm talking, the man stops me and says, Are you the pretty girl with the glasses and long brown hair? Well... I am the only girl that works in this store and that has long brown hair and glasses, so I say yes with hesitation and he says, What's your name? My daughter loved you the other day. I also think you're gorgeous. Morning if you want to go out for coffee sometime. I smile and say, My name's Anna. Thank you, but I do have a boyfriend. I genuinely do have a boyfriend. I automatically thought about the man from the other day and put two and two together. For the sake of privacy, I'm not going to use his real name and just call him Richard. Richard then says, Of course a pretty girl like you is a boyfriend. But coffee doesn't hurt, does it? I'm a quiet girl and don't really like many friends and something just felt off about this guy. I couldn't really put my finger on it. I didn't want to disrespect my boyfriend at the time and go out to coffee with this guy, so again I said, I'm sorry, I don't think my boyfriend would appreciate that. Is there any more questions about the pain therapy system I can answer for you, though? With slight anger in his voice, Richard says, Yeah, if you could hold one for me, that would be great. I'll be there within a few days. After the phone conversation, I look down at my cell phone on the counter and see I have a Facebook friend request from six minutes ago. It's Richard. I get creeped out because I know I for sure didn't say my last name to him, and we would still be on the phone while he added me so that means he dug through all of the Annas in the city just to find me. Around two minutes later I feel a vibration and it's a Facebook message. You guessed it, from Richard. The message entailed, God you're so gorgeous, you really won't go out for coffee? You look unhappy in your relationship and I think you could do much better. Me sitting there reading this, I couldn't believe the nerve he had to say these things. What does this guy want from me? I mark the message as unread, trying to give off the hint that I don't really care. The next day, I had the morning shift and worked 9 to 5. Around 10 a.m., Richard strolls in, I think. Ugh, great. He buys the pain therapy system and storms off in anger. Weird, but okay. All I can think is, how does he know when I work? How did he know when to call? Curious, I go through the phone's caller display and notice that there was a number that called quite frequently over the past few days and went to Richard's account on the computer and the numbers lined up. My coworker's shift starts at 2 and when she came in I asked her if she had answered this number the other day when she was working. She said, Yeah, I picked it up uh, every time and no one was on the other end. That means Richard called to make sure I was working until I finally picked up the one day. Creepy. 
I continued to get various Facebook messages from Richard calling me harsh names, then taking them back and apologizing. At this point, I got fed up and just decided to block him. Not even a full week later, I get into work at 2 and my manager says, There was a guy here for you this morning at 9. The store doesn't open up until 9.30, so I thought it was odd and asked, Can you describe him? What did he want? She said, Brown skin, blue eyes, and bald? Kind of short, too. Another thing he asked is if you were here, and I said no, and he just walked off. I thought, Richard. I didn't think anything else of it since I blocked him and... He can't do much other than show up at the mall, which security would just tell him to stop making me uncomfortable and buzz off. I lived about a 15 minute walk to work and I decided to walk instead of Uber my lazy self as there wasn't too much snow and the sun was shining. As I was walking, I felt a text vibration and I opened my phone to find a number I haven't seen before. The text said, You walk to work? You must live close. My heart dropped and replied saying, who is this? Seconds later, I get a text saying, Richard, I got your number off of Facebook before you blocked me. I can't believe I had my number on there. How could I be so stupid? I panicked. He must be close if he saw me. I started walking faster work and got there in a record time of nine minutes, hoping he wasn't following behind. I didn't see anything. The coast was clear. The same day I went for lunch and saw him sitting in the front seats of the food court as I was going to get food. He didn't see me because I bolted back to work before he even had a chance to look up from his phone. After that day, nothing happened for a few months. I broke up with the guy I was dating and moved back home with my dad. I went through my block list on Facebook and unblocked everyone that was on it, Richard being one of them as he hasn't bothered me since that day. I also don't like holding grudges, so I thought I was safe. Wrong. The day that I unblocked him, I got a message saying, Oh, you're single. Coffee? I was single and was kind of feeling lonely at this point, so I said, What the heck? Maybe he's a nice guy that genuinely wants to get to know me. I messaged him back saying, Not until I get to know you first. Tell me about yourself. Richard replied, I'm 35 have an amazing daughter, and want some company. I thought this was weird as he was really attractive. How can he not have a girlfriend after all? Really overthinking the whole thing. As I was lost in a daze, I get another text saying, Actually, you should come over, or I'll go over there. You live near me. I can drive over tonight. I pull back and ask, And where is it you think I live? He texts back with a street going off on my actual street, I automatically freeze. How does he know where I live now? I've been living at my dad's for months, which was farther than my last place. Let's just say I'm glad iPhones can block numbers. I reblocked him on Facebook and pray that I don't see him again. When I got back to work, I told a security guard what I had went through, and he said he would keep an eye out, but there's really not much they can do other than tell him to not bother me in the mall premises. I see him stroll by the store every now and then, gazing at me with an angry look. I guess the coast is clear, for now. I live in a rural area in the Midwest, one of those areas that has nothing but acres of land around you. I came to learn a few years ago the land where my house was built over 80 years ago was once a farmland with slaves who were chained up in wooden cabins when they weren't needed. Honestly hearing that story broke my heart, and I hoped and prayed those slaves found peace in the afterlife. When we first moved into this house, there was an old barn that was still standing a bit far from the house, but I never went into it, and turns out the owner already sold the barn before he sold us the house, and it was due to be taken down. It wasn't long before a crew came in and started taking it down, but before they could finish it, ended up collapsing and coming down on its own. Where the last house on the street and a bit further down the road from my house is a very tiny, old and what I assume to be a family-owned cemetery. And when I say old, I mean so old you can't even read the names on the tombstones, which are very thin and clearly were handmade, 
and because of that little cemetery, I always had a feeling these houses would be haunted. And I can't speak for my neighbors, but I definitely know mine is, but that's another story for another time. My room is on the bottom floor and faces the backyard and also the stairs that lead up onto a landing that leads up to the deck. And one autumn night I'm sitting in my room with the window open, enjoying the cooler weather when I heard someone walking up and down the stairs. I think it's my uncle, so I didn't bother to look, but after I kept hearing those footsteps wondering why he could have been walking up and down there so much, I became confused and when I looked over... I saw absolutely no one. I got up, walked to the window to see if maybe it was my uncle and he just stepped out of view but there was no one. And a few seconds later I began to hear those footsteps again and I immediately panic and slam my window shut, lock it and pull down the blinds, pull the curtains and jump back into bed trying to process what just happened. After I calm down and get back to working on my computer that's when I start to hear tapping on my window, and not just regular tapping, it was always three taps. And being an avid Ghost Adventures fan, I learned that if something taps or knocks three times, then it's demonic. So I do my best to calm my beating heart and just act like I didn't hear it, which was a mistake on my part because the taps went from light to heavy and happened just a few seconds apart, always being in threes. My grandmother, who was in her bedroom down the hall from me, ended up hearing the tapping and came to my room to see if I had heard it also, and I told her, yeah, it's right outside my window. My grandmother, being the fearless woman she is, went to the back door, flipped the light on and opened the door looking right down to where my bedroom window is, then looked at me and said, baby, there's nothing there. I ended up texting my cousin, who was upstairs at the time, asking if he had heard it, and he said, yeah, but I thought it was you or Grandma doing something downstairs making that noise. I told him no. I was on my computer and Grandma was asleep. We weren't doing anything. A few minutes later, he texted me back saying he went outside and looked and saw nothing. Tapping stopped after that, I guess. Whatever it was didn't like that it caught the attention of my family. I still live in that house and nothing like that has happened again and honestly, I don't ever want it to. I hate to think that it was something demonic, and that it was targeting me. October 25th, 2015 was the worst day of my life. I lost my best friend, my dad. They started off normal. My dad called me in the morning to tell me him and my uncle would be picking me up to take me to my grandmother's to do some baby supplies shopping with her, being I was around 22 weeks pregnant. The whole drive to my grandmother's, my father was saying everything a daughter wants to hear from a dad, like that I would be a great mom, he was so proud of me, that I actually didn't mind my boyfriend, who he tried to beat up not long after finding out I was pregnant, stuff like that. We get to my grandmother's, we all hung out for a while and eventually I go with her in her car and my dad gets into my uncle's SUV again. He jumps back out of my uncle's SUV, which was unusual for him and comes to my window, gives me a huge hug and tells me he loves me so much. And that was the last time I ever saw him. A couple of hours later, I'm home, waiting on my boyfriend to come home from work. Boyfriend comes home. We're sitting around for a couple of minutes talking about our days and he casually mentions that he got detoured because there was a huge accident on the way home and there was a fatality. I instantly feel a cold wave hits me. I knew it was my dad and my uncle. Just this terrible gut feeling. I frantically start calling and texting both of them. I texted my uncle that I heard that there was an accident and it better not be you. I told my boyfriend I had to go and I had to know if my terrible feeling was right. My boyfriend wasn't so thrilled to go back in the car trying to convince me that it probably wasn't them but he reluctantly came with me. As I'm driving there, I'm getting the worst possible feeling, a feeling of dread. I get to the accident scene. No barriers have been set up, but the cops have it blocked off. I got out of my car and walked up to the cop car. 
finally being able to get a decent look at the flipped, destroyed SUV. I knew it must have been his SUV as soon as I'd seen it, but I still asked the cop what kind it was. She said what I dreaded hearing the most. It was the make and model of my uncle's SUV. She then asked me where my dad was sitting because the passenger was killed. They didn't identify him at that point until I came and told them. It's never a good feeling being the one that has to call all your family to tell them there's been an accident and your loved one didn't make it. Fast forward, a week goes by. My mom, brother, stepdad, and aunts are driving across the country to be at his memorial. They use some kind of travel company to find cheap hotels as they drive across. They're about halfway across and they get a call from the travel company. It goes to voicemail. It's a man. He's crying and saying stuff about how he had to start a fire with a beer box. Just weird stuff. My mom called the company back demanding answers on why someone would do that. The company seemed confused. They didn't have any males that worked in the office and there was no way it could have been from them. About a month after his death, I was sleeping and wake up to what sounded like work boots walking around my house. I get up to check. I look around. No one's there. Door's locked. I go use the bathroom and crawl back into bed. I wasn't too concerned about it. Maybe it was just the cats. Sometime after I fall asleep, I had a dream. In this dream, my dad was walking around my living room in his work boots. He was crying and saying how sorry he was about everything that happened. My dad's work boots was one of the few things I had of his. They had been sitting by my front door. I wish to share what I believe was a paranormal experience that occurred to me approximately 10 years ago. It's not your typical Hollywood scare story, but all the same, I have not experienced anything like this in my life, and it has questioned my belief in the afterlife. About 10 years ago, I worked as an estate agent in my hometown in North Wales. It was a job I didn't enjoy very much, but it did give me the opportunity to go out and view many different and interesting properties. One such property was a Jacobian hall dating back to around the 1600s. The property had been repossessed by the bank, and my company was tasked with listing the property to sell. The property naturally had a lot of history, the most notable being visited by Oliver Cromwell's brother. I was also told it had a reputation for paranormal activity with numerous sightings of ghosts, so I was intrigued and excited to visit the house. When we were given the keys by the bank to list the property for sale, myself and my colleague Sue went along to take photos, measurements, and write up a full property description for the sales brochure. When we entered the hall, we worked our way around each room, basically writing down every main feature we saw. The property was in disrepair and in need of a lot of renovation. We worked our way upstairs, going through each bedroom. When I stepped into one particular bedroom, I felt a great chill shoot down my spine and my whole body suddenly went cold. I remember the weather not being cold that day and for my body temperature to drop so suddenly didn't make sense at all. To add to the coldness I was feeling, I felt like I was going to cry. I felt an incredible amount of emotion and I didn't understand why. It's pretty hard to explain but it's a feeling I have never experienced before and it's something that didn't feel right at all. I called Sue into the room and asked her if she felt cold, to which she told me she didn't. She then saw I had tears in my eyes and asked if I was okay. I told her something didn't feel right, so by this time, we both agreed it would be best to finish up getting all the details we needed and get back to the office. Fast forward a couple of weeks after that eventful day, and naturally the property attracted a lot of interest. One such person was a lady who we arranged to show around. I couldn't show the lady around myself due to me being tied up with another client, so it was left to Sue to carry out the viewing. When Sue returned to the office, she told me the lady she met actually claimed herself to be a white witch, possessing supernatural abilities. Her only intention was to view the property so she could make a connection with the spirits from the past. Given the history of the place, the white witch picked up on a number of spirits in the house. One such notable spirit was located in the bedroom I had that strange occurrence. 
She told Sue that a child had actually died in that very bedroom and that there was a great sadness associated with the room due to the tragedy. My jaw nearly dropped to the floor when Sue told me this. Everything was starting to make some sort of sense. To this day, I never experienced anything like what happened to me the day I visited that property. It has made me think that there may well be some sort of spiritual world that exists beyond this world, but the experience that occurred that day is something that I will never forget, and I wish to never experience again. This story took place when I was around 12. My parents signed me up for a camp in Austria that involves all kinds of activities that you can sign up for. This was my first time separating with my parents for such a long time, a total of three weeks. Let me tell you a bit about the camp, so you can get the picture. Each person would have their own schedule of activities. However, my schedule had a lot of holes in it, so I would have nothing to do about every other day. Instead, I'd spend time around the camp's building. Among other things, it had a pool and since it was summer, it had many people in it during the day. We were not allowed to use it before breakfast or after dinner. I loved swimming so I visited the pool frequently and it was pretty fun. One day, I was splashing in the water like usual and there were these three boys pranking all the other girls. We had water gun fights and played all kinds of other games and it was actually fun. I thought I made friends. That was until it got weird. I liked eating my breakfast quickly because for a short time while the water was too cold for anyone else, I could enjoy the pool for myself. One of these mornings I got changed and headed for the pool and those three boys were near the boxes full of toys and equipment. They were putting on goggles and said hi. One of them, the leader of the other two, handed me some goggles from the box and told me to put them on. I said thanks and jumped into the pool. I was swimming back and forth under the water and eventually saw them jumping in too. I thought nothing of it and just kept swimming around. I bounced off the pool wall and as I was drifting to the other side, when I saw one of the boys swim underneath me, facing me. He had a big grin on his face and was giving me the thumbs up. I was confused but then the other two joined in. They were just watching me swim from the bottom of the pool and I soon realized why. I was only one year older than the other girls in the group, but I looked a bit, shall we say, mature. I was not prepared for puberty like that, so my bra fit a bit too tightly. These idiots. Soon, four people entered the pool, and we continued playing like nothing happened. I wasn't too concerned. I thought it was just all some sort of game. With more people crowding the pool, the trio was getting away with more stuff. They were watching me jumping into the pool and joked that they were waiting for my swimsuit to just slide off. They were getting more touchier in their games, looking at me and tugging my arms like it's just a game. At this point, I got more serious and asked them to stop. And then the main boy got angry. He suddenly shoved me under the water, laughing, and the other two sunk too. Underwater, they were holding my arms and legs to restrain me while the other guy was reaching his hand to take off my bra. I screamed underwater, almost drowning now, and began kicking them where I knew I should. They let go and I gasped for air. I swam to the edge of the pool and one of them got really close and whispered how they do things to me and no one will know. I got out of the pool and ran to the changing room quickly. They would continue harassing me for the next couple of days. I would try to go swim at odd hours, but I would see them run towards me and jump in the pool before me. They would rattle the door to the changing room if I tried to get dressed. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even feel too scared, I just didn't understand what was going on. I was very passive about everything. At last I told one of my few girlfriends about it and she was furious how I should have told her sooner. That morning we both went swimming and the boys were there. She was very angry, so she told the guys to leave me alone. So for the rest of my time there, I would only go swimming when she did too, and they wouldn't bother me. To this day, I feel anxious thinking about how close I was to something bad happening. What if I never told anyone? At the time, I believed their threats. Many other things contributed to me not trusting guys, but I'd rather not share that. But this story, 
is what started it all. I could not see the red flags then. I only remember the details of it because I found a journal from my time there. It's been many years and I hope that I will one day be able to find someone I can trust. I am not so blind anymore. A few months back, I had met a guy in the woods. Bad idea, I know. I asked if he was some sort of killer, and he responded yes. Fast forward to almost a half a year later, we are happily dating, and he is by far the best person I had ever met. I had just gotten out of a toxic relationship, and I believed relationships were constantly fighting for everyone. My now boyfriend has proved me wrong. He's so sweet and caring. He is literally my soulmate, and dreams come to life and I know I'm going to marry him. So perfect is hard to believe. But the hard thing about life is that nothing good comes without a consequence. The only negative aspect about my boyfriend is his dad. For this story, I'll call him Richard since the nickname suits him perfectly. To give some background, Richard is a man who knows many people and has lots of money, yet as of recent seems to be running dry. He also was abusive to his two wives and his children, he also has custody of his two children, although my boyfriend is 19 and his daughter is 17. He ended up winning the custody battle because of his fancy lawyer. The sad part is, as soon as he got custody, he left his kids with a random church family and moved to my state, which was quite the distance away. My boyfriend ended up moving to my state to work for Richard's company. The trouble with Richard is that he is a narcissist. The money only makes matters worse. He thrives off control and power, especially with his kids. Going out to eat with him is awful. For example, the first time I met him was at dinner where he proceeded to tell the waiter to sit on his lap. It was awful. When he sees his daughter, he is especially creepy and controlling. He talks about her body too in a creepy way if you know what I'm talking about. As of recent, he went on a trip for a month which left my boyfriend and I to spend some time with each other. Over the month, we became inseparable. When he got back, however, things are turning sour very quickly. He always said that my boyfriend and I could not see each other for more than four hours a week. Only married people do that. So, as rebellious teens, we found a wedding catalog and were going to leave it out in front for him to see. Deciding against it, we hid the catalog. When he got back, however, he went digging through my boyfriend's room immediately, and you guessed it, found the catalog. I didn't know until one morning after breakfast he looked me dead in the eyes and said, Are you my daughter-in-law? I practically choked. He thought we had eloped when he was gone. Once he found out we didn't, things went downhill. He forced me to go shopping and gave me all these expensive items that I tried to deny. During the little shopping spree when my boyfriend was not around, Richard would get really close to me and touch my arm or wrap his arm around me uncomfortably. He would get close to my face like he was going to make a move on his son's girlfriend and say, So why are you with him? Or, Are you sure you want to stay with him? It was awful and made me feel horrible when my boyfriend would come back all smiley and having a good day for once. The more I thought about it, the more I realized Richard was trying to play mind games and almost buy me out and completely screw over his son with no way to leave. After that day... He has increased pressure. I am now not allowed to see my boyfriend without Richard's supervision. There is now high-tech cameras with audio everywhere. He is building a huge house for me and my boyfriend to live in with him. He is even putting in a tub for his future grandkids. He keeps saying we aren't allowed to get engaged until after college. He answers my boyfriend's phone. My boyfriend isn't allowed to be on his phone after 9. He now can't even stay with me on his only day off and he's threatened to bury his son if we have kids before 30, and if he didn't think it could get worse, it does. Today, Richard was snooping through my boyfriend's room and was picking out a stain on the blanket. He then looks over and pulls out my thong from under the bed. Up till today, he thought I was this huge religious girl who was waiting till marriage. That was the only way I was allowed to see my boyfriend, even though Richard didn't wait got married at 19 and did horrible unchristian like things to his wives and kids so now he's mad my boyfriend is giving up hope for getting away from him 
and I am never going to be able to see my boyfriend until he is away from Richard. If you are wondering why my boyfriend hasn't left yet, it's because Richard has access to his bank account. He's his boss, and he keeps him so broke he can't save for housing. As of recently, Richard will pull a stunt like picking out all the expensive items. Then when they get up to the register, he says he forgot his card, so my boyfriend has to pay after the cashier already scanned the items or after they had eaten their food. The biggest problem is over a truck. My boyfriend has this truck he bought and worked three jobs for in high school. Richard paid for the rest as a graduation present and is currently being worked on in another state. This truck is everything to my boyfriend and there is no name on the title as of now. Richard threatens to put his name on the title and sell it for lots of money. My boyfriend refuses to leave the situation till he gets his childhood dream truck he's invested so much money into. He is also afraid to leave because his father then will move his little sister up here to live way up in the woods alone with him, the same daughter that he's tried to cuddle with in just his underwear in her bed. She's 17 and he also talks about her things. If anyone has any ideas or advice, I would appreciate it. I am stuck and I feel like I'm losing hope. I know that this is what he wants and I won't give in. My boyfriend has also told me I'm the only reason he has hoped to keep fighting and leave after he gets the truck. My heart goes out to anyone who's experienced anything similar. It is so mentally and physically exhausting I'm drained. That may also be because I am possibly pregnant too. I will update as things progress. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.